Lamentations chapter number one. For those of you unfamiliar with this book of the Bible, for decades, the prophet Jeremiah, through some 50 chapters of the book of Jeremiah, has preached to Israel that God's judgment was coming upon them because of the way that they were living. And then as a result of his preaching, we have zero recorded converts over decades. Okay, so for lack of a better term, we can say that Jeremiah spent a good, you know, most of his life preaching that God's judgment was coming, nobody believed him, and then God's judgment came. The book of Lamentations, also written by the prophet Jeremiah, is him lamenting, hence the name of the book, lamenting the state that Israel found herself in. Because one, it was preventable. Israel did not have to suffer the wrath and the judgment of God. They did not have to be carried off into captivity again. But because they chose not to repent, that judgment came upon them. It was their choice, just like it was their choice to, before God told Jeremiah to go start preaching to them, to start living the way that God said not to live. That was their choice. But it was preventable. Also, it was very tragic. When God does what he says he's going to do, God doesn't pull any punches. God does not promise to bring judgment and then bring rebuke. Right? He had already re rebuked him. That was Jeremiah's job. He had preached to him. He said, hey, you're going the wrong way. Turn around. But we don't have time to read. But if we read the whole beginning of this chapter, he says that Israel cries out, there's nobody standing in their gates anymore. The walls have been torn down. There's nobody left in Jerusalem. They were all taken away in captivity. That everything that once was good has now been laid flat. All the riches that they used to have, now they're in somebody else's house. In other words, if you were to look at Israel after God's judgment, you wouldn't have known that Israel ever used to be great. You'd have thought, man, what a dump. So not only was it preventable, not only was it tragic, right? but also we find that Jeremiah still had a great love for God's people. They were his people. These are his friends, his family. These are his kinfolk. And he looks and his heart breaks because of what they find themselves in. Right? Now some people may not be like me. I'm real good at, well, did you do something stupid? Yeah, then why are you complaining about what you got, got to deal with now? Right? This is the, you be, be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever, man. So that shall he also reap. You did it. You got to pay the price for it. Right, but then other people call me insensitive, right? And then I've, I've had the, the term heartless thrown at me. Now, I can feel sorry for them, but it doesn't mean that they don't deserve to be there. Yeah, well, Jeremiah, he, he's not as uh, uh, stoic or crass as Brother Jordan may be. Okay, he sees what they are going through, and it breaks his heart. And the entire book of Lamentation is basically... Him pouring out his soul on how heartbroken he is for where God's people used to be and where they find themselves at. Because again, it was all preventable. Okay, so with all that backstory, chapter number one, verse number one. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces how is she become tributary she weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her all her friends have dealt treacherously with her they are become her enemies that's the situation that Jeremiah finds Israel in let's go back to verse number one how does this city sit solitary you know what solitary means empty, alone, by itself. Everybody that used to be there, they was taken out. And they weren't taken out by choice. They were taken out either by the sword or they were taken out in chains. Then he says, how has she become as a widow? 
Well, what does the word widowed mean? That she was left alone. Right? Her spouse died, and then now she's left alone. And then the Bible talks about those that are widow indeed, which means she has no husband and has no children. Under Bible times, that meant she had nobody to take care of her. It meant that unless God or unless one of her neighbors moved in, she's probably going to die too. But we already know the city's a solitary. A woman that's a widow and has no one around her isn't going to end up very well. If you don't believe me, go look at the book of Ruth and see what would have happened to Naomi if Ruth wouldn't have gone with her. How did Naomi make a living? Because Ruth found favor in the eyes of a man named Boaz. That's how she received her meat every day. In fact, that's what Ruth said, not only enough for me, but it's got to be enough for my mother-in-law too. Boaz told him, do what? Drop some handfuls on purpose. Make sure she's loaded up when she goes back. Because everything else that they needed, guess how you, they got it. They sold what was left over after they ate. And they went and they bought. But God's people... They had no one else. They were as a widow. She that was great among the nations. What does that mean? She's the best. Now, it says, in princess among the provinces. Meaning, the most beautiful, the most pristine, the best of the best. How has she become tributary? Now, tributary is something that you pay because you owe somebody else. Tribute is what you give to somebody who's greater than you are. Tribute is something that you don't have a choice in it. It's due, and whether you pay it or not, they're going to come and get it. Okay, nowadays we use that word taxes. If you don't pay it, they're going to get it. May not be today, may not be tomorrow. Miss Billy's back there with a smirk on her face, shaking her head. She knows they're going to get it. Can't avoid it. But how was the one that was the best? How was the one that was the princess among the provinces? The most desirable. Right? The most precious thing. Certainly in God's eyes, these are God's chosen people. But the place that God found altogether lovely, blessed beyond measure, pressed down, shaking and bubbling over. The ones that he had led out of Egypt after they'd been in captivity there. Right? The ones that he delivered Canaan land to. The ones, keep in mind, this is after David and Solomon. Right? Solomon, under his reign, God prospered Israel to the greatest that it had ever been. Kings and dignitaries from all over the world came to see what made Israel so great and what made their king so wise. And you know, the Queen Sheba came to realize it wasn't the king and it wasn't the people, it was the God that they served. That Israel. Right now, looks like a ghost town, according to verse number one. Well, verse number two. She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Right, to weep, we all know what that is, but y'all ever weep so hard that you become sore as a result of it? Here, it says she weepeth sore in the night. The time where she's supposed to be resting... She's weeping herself to where her body actually aches. It says and her tears are on her cheek. There's no comfort. There's no one to dry those tears. Right in the New Testament, we find that God records all the tears that you cry. God thinks they're so precious that He bottles them. That they're a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord if you pray and roll those burdens over on Him. But here, there's nobody to wipe those tears away. Where do they sit? On her cheeks. There's no one there to come. She's got to deal and live in that sore, in that bitterness of where she's found herself. It says, among all of her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. Notice it doesn't say spouse. It says lovers. Israel had fallen in with a whole lot of idolatry. Right? God makes a very clear distinction between adultery and fornication and false gods. Why? Because they were sworn 
to the one that bought them, to the one that chose them. And they chose God. That's what Abraham did. God spoke to Abraham. What did he do? He left everything and went looking after God. New Testament tells us he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He wasn't going to be happy until he found it. Why? Because he wanted to live where God was. Right? Israel chose God and God chose them. Sounds a whole lot like a marriage. But here it says that none of her lovers were there to comfort her. Right? All those false gods weren't there to help her. All those false nations that they had fallen in with that promised them you know, great and uh, beautiful things. They had great swelling words that tickled their ears. Now when they fell upon hard times, they're nowhere to be found. All those that she thought were going to be there to help her, make her life better, they've, you know, cut out, left her high and dry. Uh, well, it says all her friends have dealt treacherously with her. You know all those people that used to be on Israel's side? You know what they did when Babylon came in? They turned on her. They fell to Babylon before then and they said, Hey, we're not much, but we know where you can get a whole lot of gold, where you can get a whole lot of riches, where you can get the best of the best. What did they do? They stabbed them in the back. They dealt treacherously with her. They said, Take it easy on us and we'll help you find the back door into Jerusalem the back door into Judah or into Israel we know where they keep the good stuff well how do you know all that because they let us see it one time but then it says they are become her enemies you ever been in a place where the people that yesterday were hand in hand with you working, laboring and then something changed and all of a sudden they're on the other side of the line fighting against you where yesterday they were arming hand in hand laboring, working on the same thing for the same purpose, for the same cause it's not that they just left you, they turned on you but it's one thing to be abandoned it's another to be betrayed but where's Israel at in this situation? She's been betrayed by everyone that she knows. Now why did that happen? Again, they forsook God and made arrangements, right, deals, treaties with other people and thought that they had no need of God. God had to prove to them that all the people they were trusting in would not only stab them in the back, they'd deliver them up for complete destruction. And the one that could have intervened, right? he couldn't do it. Why? Because they weren't living the way that he said to live. There was one that was stronger than all their enemies. Well, why didn't he show up? Because they had forsaken their first love. They had broken those vows that they had made to God. And what did they do? They made vows to other people. What did they find out? People break their word and their vows, but God never breaks his. What did he vow? judgment now I know that this is the Old Testament there are a lot of Bible scholars say well in the Old Testament you can't make comparisons to the church age because that was under the law, hogwash you know, writer Hebrews the Apostle Paul, what do they all say it was given to us as an end sample it was our schoolmaster for what purpose, to teach us the difference between right and wrong and the fact that the law couldn't save you. But one day there was one that would save you. So on the authority of God, because the Bible is written by the Holy Ghost, I'm going to use this and compare it to the church age. Right? If anybody's watching on YouTube, Brother Randy, that probably just made them really mad. But I know this is talking about Israel. But it ain't as bad as it is in these two verses or in this chapter or in this book. But I see a lot of comparisons to where the church is today and where Israel found themselves in Lamentations chapter number 1. On the whole, places that once you could walk in, right, feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. People get up and sing and it would touch your heart. And the Holy Ghost start massaging that heart. And the preacher get up and the Holy Ghost might break your heart. And you have to come and repent. 
Or the Holy Ghost may squeeze your heart a little bit. Next thing you know, you're shouting up or jumping up and shouting like Brother Phil does. Right? Y'all look at him and like, well, there he goes again. Well, you'd go that way too if you got right with God. Anyway, it's just true. You're going to worship if you're right with God and you're in God's house and God shows up. But anyway, places it used to be. You could walk in and you could not only feel the presence of God, you could feel it so good that you didn't want to leave. That they'd stay, and it may not be preaching like until midnight like the Apostle Paul did, right? but they'd stay in fellowship before church and after church because it's just good being around God's house. And nowadays you walk past them and they've been raised and they put up shopping malls in their places. There it's been bought out and now it's being used... I mean, I remember one time a church got bought it and it was like a AV repair joint. Still had the steeple on top of it. You say, what happened? Well, I don't know anything about it. I just remember that there, that used to be a church, but it wasn't no more. There's churches that I've been to where we've had great services. Nowadays, doors are locked, chained, property for sale, bought out. Or it was paid off, and the people decided that it just wasn't worth it anymore. We're talking about the church. Bible believing, blood bought, born again, right? Joined together in one body by the Holy Ghost. Churches. But if God thought Israel was pretty precious, He called them the princesses of the province, right? Great among the nations. Well, you want to know what Jesus thought of the church? He loved it, and he gave himself for it. You know who Jesus died for? It? Sinners, but he also died for the church to pay for it. He bought it with his own blood. That tells me that God cares a whole lot about the church. You can't find in your Bible where God ever wants anything but growth, right, blessing, and continuation of the church. It was never in God's plan that the church gets smaller. It was never God's plan that one of the churches that were founded were ever shut up. It was God's will that they do what? They go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. That they tell others what had been told unto them, the gospel, the good news, what Jesus had done for them that nobody else could do for them. And it was God's will that they go and multiply. He tells us to be fruitful and to multiply. Right? He instructs us to disciple. Right? That apologetics, the word that nowadays nobody uses anymore. That means that if you don't understand why the Bible says that we believe a certain way, we teach you what the Bible says. So much so that you can understand it enough that if Brother Jordan and the pastor and everybody else that's been called to preach... Hopefully not, Brother Ron. But if we all fell off the face of the earth, that somebody would be able to stand up next Sunday and tell you what the Bible says about things. Discipleship is that you have been made a disciple. Well, what's a disciple's job? To go make other disciples. Right? It was God's intention that if you was the only Christian left, you'd be able to teach other people why Christians believe what they believe. Because there's no respect to our persons. Jesus said that he called his friends, that he kept no secrets from what God delivered unto us. You know what that means? You know, I dare say, more about doctrine and what God intended than Peter and John and James. Why? Because some of them died before it was all written. But he said that he's no, he gave to them just as much as he gave to you. They could touch people and heal them. Why? Because the Bible hadn't been completed yet. He said, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is done away with. Jesus said, I gave you everything that you needed to multiply, and yet in our days it looks like it's shrinking. I'm talking about people that say they believe the same book. Now I get it. We had wonderful services last week. But marvelous, I have no problem not getting up and teaching Sunday school if God shows up. Hallelujah. Right? I'll go back and study twice as hard if it means that I don't have to teach next week. Right? I'm all for what the Lord wants. I know that we've got something special. Everybody comes around here and tells us that we got something special. 
But what I'm saying is there's places that's had special a lot longer than we did, been around for a lot longer than we have, and yet today you couldn't find it. All evidence that it ever existed has been wiped off the earth. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? That's not God's fault. It's not God's fault that Israel suffered what Israel suffered in the book of Lamentations. Keep in mind, Jeremiah's been preaching for decades up to this point. They got so angry at him, they threw him in prison so many times, tried to kill him. God wouldn't let him because God wouldn't let them go into God's judgment without having to step over God. He'd have been justified to do what he said he would do without giving them any warning because he told them long ago right if God says it once that should be enough we say that but then yet we ask well how come nobody told me God did it's in the Bible what other proof do you need but because God loved them what did he do he sent one more preacher by to tell them one more time and not just once he preached for years the same message Different ways, but the same message. Repent. Repent. You're going the wrong way. But what happened? They chose. It wasn't God's fault that Israel ended up in this place. It's not God's fault that churches split or that churches close or that churches have Ichabod stamped over the door. That's not God's fault. That's people's fault. It was Israel's fault that Israel ended up in this position. I, I know it sounds harsh, but it's those churches' fault that those churches ended up in those positions. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, I don't want it to happen around here. So we got to look at what happens in order for this to happen so that we can be on the lookout, be vigilant, be sober, right? stand in the gap, make up the hedge. Well, why are we talking about this after the services that we had last week? Because when God gets to moving, that's when the devil puts the bullseye on you. God don't, or the devil don't care about churches that are dead. They don't bother them. Churches where people don't get saved, he don't have a problem with them. Why? Because they're ineffective. They're ineffectual. But those where they realize that all hell has is a whole bunch of gates and God's got real good battering rams that we can rescue the perishing, care for the dying, that we can go out and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God, those are the ones that he gets a little nervous about. Those that have a touch, those are the ones that he wants to throw a damp towel on. The ones that have a spark of revival, he's over there trying to keep the wind from blowing from stirring that spark, turn it into smoke, and then a flame comes out of it. So how did Israel end up in this place? How does so many churches? That church should be growing. That's the way that God intended it. Not just talking about a church. I'm talking collectively, all churches. The global church that Jesus bought and paid for. All churches should be growing. Keyword should. I use that all the time. I get phone calls at work, and they say, well, this should fix the problem. I'm like, key word there is should. But I know that we have found out that this is the problem, but I'm just keeping the back of your mind, there might be something else. Churches should be a lot of things, but I've seen a lot of Christians that weren't, and their church wasn't, because the people weren't. The church is only as good as those Christians in it. You don't believe me? Go read the first book of, well, the first two chapters of the book of Revelation. God told the Apostle John to write seven physical letters to seven New Testament real world churches to the pastors of those churches, and God gave an account to all of them. He said, I know you've been doing this. You've done good by doing this, but I have somewhat against thee, or I have ought against thee. Are there some things that you need to be doing better? We're talking within less than one generation from when the church was started. And churches were already doing wrong. In the eyes of God. People are people. I get it. But God's bigger than people. And if God's people stick close to God, God's going to take care of all the nonsense. 
Why do you think he told the Apostle John to write those letters? To prune the weeds out and to keep the fruit, the living vine, prospering. So how do you end up where once a princess among the provinces? Right, to borrow a term from nowadays, right, the apple of the Lord's eye. How do you go from that to absolute desolation? Well, first, it's because people get a little bit of pride. God's near those of a contrite spirit. He resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to whom? The humble. You know when you're in a real good position to be humbled by God when you start getting too big for your britches. Now as a humble person comes into church and thanks the preacher for the message because they know they need it. A prideful person comes in and asks the preacher why he preached it. Maybe not to his face, but in their heart. The whole time they're sitting on the pew, well, why do we got to hear this again? Well, one, it's either because you need it or two, it's because you forgot it and one day you're going to need it. You say, well, that's pretty simplistic, Brother Jordan. Well, I find that God doesn't waste time doing things that don't need being done. God does all things well. God does not plunder His grace and His mercy. He doesn't throw it away to the dogs. Right? He gives His choice blessings to the church. You know what that means? God's not going to teach you or remind you of something that you don't need. You know why the preacher had a burden for it? Because God told him that it was worth preaching. Well, why would God have him preach it if you didn't need it? Just being honest. But all them times that I get up here and I say there was nowhere in the notes, that's because I couldn't help but say it. Because God put it in down here and then it popped up here and I'm just simple enough that if God tells me to say it, Brother Randy, I'm going to say it. But why do you think the Holy Ghost does things that way because here's the thing Holy Ghost I can get up and preach whatever God lays on my heart God's going to let you hear whatever you need to hear out of it so that the Holy Ghost can take it and give to you what it is that you need I'm not saying you can get up unprepared and I'm not saying that you can get up and just say anything but I'm saying if you get up and you give what God put on your heart the people are going to hear what the people need to hear but don't, it's the only way that the church can function is that the Holy Ghost is the one that's really doing the preaching and the one really working on people's hearts. I can't give you what you need. I can't give me what I need. Right? I have to get what I need where? From the Holy Ghost, from God, from His Word, from prayer. If I can't help myself, what makes me, th me think that I can help anybody else? Right? The old adage, we're all just beggars showing other beggars where we found some bread. I didn't open up a bakery. I'm just saying, I found out that if we go over here, we get real good food. It's exactly what you need. In fact, it's so good that it's not just what we need. He gives us more than that. Right? We all got belts that are you know, bigger than the ones we used to have. Right? We all got clothes that don't fit no more. Why? Probably because, you know, we like food. But also, we can eat that much food. Why? Because God's been good to us. We're not starving. We're not down to skin and bone. But that's the way that God is with the church. Right? He said that He would give right, of His fatness. Right? You know what that is? Fat is where the flavor comes from. If you want meat that doesn't taste like anything, get a meat from a cow that's just all skin and bones. It don't have no fat. Then you got them Japanese cows that, you know, they like pet its, you know, comb its hair every day for like 35 years or however long it is, and they feed it all the best food, and then they try to sell you like a piece of this much for like $900. I don't know, it's called Wagyu beef. But, you know why that's so expensive? Got a whole lot of fat in the meat. You know why the world resents the church? Because we get the fatness of God's blessing. And you know the quickest way to shut off that valve? Pride. Because the moment you think you don't need God, you'll never get to a point that you don't need God. But the moment that you have the thought or in your spirit, you think, 
Well, that's a real good message for somebody else. You're liable to start making different commitments than the ones that you should. A prideful person, instead of embracing preaching, reaches out to whatever this world calls worship. Because if you're not right with God, you know what preaching does? It hurts. This is a sharp two-edged sword. It separates between what God says and what God says not. What God approves of and what God doesn't approve of. What God will accept and what God rejects. It's real good at splitting the difference between this is holy and this is not holy. Jesus said that he came the first time not to bring peace but a sword. What to divide what God said was acceptable and all the stuff that the Jews have been doing at that point that God hadn't found acceptable. He said, this is what God had it intended, and anything else, that was all man. You know what pride does? Pride wants you to put the sword away. Because sword hurt. Preaching hurt. Praying, before it can really pick up, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but if we have unconfessed and unrepentant or sins in our heart, God won't hear our prayers. If you've got a little bit of pride, prayer doesn't get anything done. And if you're not going to sit there and admit that you were wrong, you really are wasting your time. And you're wasting God's time. Pride, just a little bit. The leaven leavens the whole lump. Pride very easily can turn into bitterness, can turn into hatred, can turn into anger. If you haven't been letting the Lord speak to your heart to keep the rest of your body and the rest of your heart in check, there's no telling what kind of wickedness will come forth out of your heart. Deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. Where does it all start with? Well, I don't need that. My man should not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You need it may not need it today but you need it you may not need it tomorrow but there's a day coming that God wants you to be prepared for it you may have a full plate of food today and you're feasting on God's fatness but there may come a time that instead of being up on the mountain you way down in the valley and you've got to eat the food that you stored away when the time was good we're supposed to be good stewards of the things of God not to let it go to waste Right? And a lot of people refer to that when it comes to the money. No, it's talking about everything. You're supposed to be good stewards of the messages that were preached to you. You're supposed to be good stewards to the teaching that people have invested in you. Right? And the fellowship that God's people have invested in. All the times that others have helped bear your burdens, you're supposed to be a good steward of that loving kindness and to show it to others. We are to take the things of God and treat them as precious and holy. And to take good care of them. Well, if you're prideful, you start thinking that God's riches, they're not as shiny as they used to be. They don't mean as much to you. Because after pride, there's a change in perspective. If you're not looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, you're liable to see a whole bunch of silliness and wonkiness and a whole bunch of other stuff going on in this world. And instead of seeing how it is foolish, you're willing to take the bait. Y'all know that my favorite book of the Bible is Proverbs. You know what I figured out by reading the book of Proverbs a whole bunch? A fool doesn't realize that he's being foolish until somebody corrects him. A fool thinks that he's right until he's proven wrong. You can look at something and say, well, that's foolishness, not to the person doing it. Because if the person knew that it was foolishness, he wouldn't be doing it. Right? Kids are dumb. That's why they invented these things called like socket plugs. Because right? kids don't know that if you stick finger in socket plug or if you stick, you know, what's a G.I. Joe sword into the electrical socket, that electricity is going to come through the G.I. Joe and then into you. Right? The, the term baby proof in a house. If babies were smart, you wouldn't have to baby proof the house. Okay? 
I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed or the brightest light bulb. Okay, a few days I feel like I deserve to be in, you know, mental institutions. But I was smart enough to figure out that when I got a whooping, I don't get the whooping if I don't do what caused me to get the whooping. Right? It took Christian a lot longer to learn those lessons than it did me. Okay, likewise, I found out that if it hurts, don't do that. I still say that to this, somebody will go, ow, and I'm like, don't do that, that hurts. But if they learn that, they'll never do it again. First time you get a paper cut, you're like, oh, that stinks, until about four days later and it got infected and it's burning and everything else. Guess what? You're going to handle paper different after you get a paper cut. Until what? Until you think it's not a problem anymore and then that's about the time you get another paper cut. That foolishness is only foolishness to people that know better. Well, if you have already been prideful, you've gotten away from the things of God, your perspective has altered to where the things that used to not make sense, all of a sudden, well, you know what? I can see their point. You know why you're buying into it? Because you've been away from the truth. You know why Israel started bowing down and worshiping other gods? Because they thought it made a difference. You know why Israel started becoming entangled with people that God said not to deal with because they thought that it was beneficial for Israel you know why the new generations that hadn't been taught the things that God did the things that they did in Israel and all the wickedness and all the idolatry and all of the chicanery going on you know why they did it because they didn't know better you know where all that started with somebody who knew better and rejecting it their works do follow them Sin, still today, does pass down to the third and fourth generation. Their perspective changed to where they thought that which was unclean all of a sudden is tolerable. That which was unrighteous now is acceptable. Not in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of man. Well, why wouldn't we trade with that company? Right? Or that nation? Or those people? Because they've got things that we want. Well, why do you want it? The fool wants it, why? To consume it upon his own lust. That's why God says you're foolish if you ask and pray for things that you may consume it upon your own lust. Pray for that which you need and that which God desires and your prayers will be answered. They promised it three times. Ask and you shall seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. He didn't just say, ask and I'll give it. Three times he said, if you go looking for it, and seek God's face for it, He'll give it to you, unless it's to consume it upon your own lust. You know what that tells me? That in Israel, there's a lot of people asking that they may consume it upon their own lust. And a long time ago, they learned that if they asked God, they weren't going to get it. So they started asking neighbors, and they started asking strangers, and they started making their own gods so that they could bow down and pray to it, because they thought there might be a chance there. Well, how does that translate to the church? You want to know why some churches have closed their doors? Because somewhere along the line, the people thought that they's in control of the church, not God. Well, really what they said was, is, well, that preacher can't tell me what to do. And they thought they were fighting against the preacher, but that's a whole different story. They didn't want what God wanted. For whatever reason. Because a pride is what it boils down to. So what'd they do? They went and they fetched them some of them gainsayers that the New Testament warns us about. That means they'll tell you whatever you want to hear as long as you pay them. They went and they found those that had flowery words of man's wisdom. Because man's wisdom tells you how good man is. Again, it's not foolishness to somebody that knows better. So those that were brought up afterwards... They're hearing the same thing from behind a so-called pulpit that they're hearing from teachers at school. So why would they go to church if they're hearing the same thing that the other people hear? Right, if I hear the same thing on, no offense to Dr. Phil, but if I hear the same thing on Dr. Phil that I hear when I go down to the church house, why wouldn't I just watch Dr. Phil? If instead of picking up the Bible, if I could pick up, you know, something that's a little bit shorter... Tells me how 
you know, beautiful and how strong and how loved I am and that I can do anything I set my mind to. There's some truth to that. But you know what the truth is? The arm of flesh is going to fail you. You can do whatever God burdens you to do because God's going to equip you and empower you to go do it. And as a man thinketh, so is he. You can be whatever you want, but most of the time, if you're turning into what you want to be, you're going to be a bunch of junk. And people forsook what God said and they replaced it with what man said and then eventually the doors get shut because God left a long time ago when God's people kicked them out. You know how it all starts? With one person saying, nah, I don't agree with that. And then that infecting a whole bunch of other people. They start having get-togethers just to ask other people, what do you think about this? You know what my answer, this is why people don't come and ask me these questions. Because they've learned that my answer is, and we've run the rest of them off, but they know if they come to me, but what do you think about this? My answer is going to be, well, here's what God thinks about this. They don't care what God thinks, they want to know what you think. And if you think what God thinks, they don't want nothing to do with you. Then all of a sudden, they've got schemes to get certain people out of the church. Or bitterness starts to put a divide right down the middle. Really, there's two church bodies. There's this group and that group. That ain't the will of God. Long before a church ever splits, there was a division between them. There's a wedge that somebody drove in real deep long before the church ever split. Long before a church will ever start using a different Bible, there's people in the pews that weren't listening to what the original one said. Long before, right, you get a preacher that teaches a bunch of hogwash, there's people in the pews trying to get rid of the one that was preaching truth. How, does, how are so many churches closing when we're supposed to be growing? Because people are more interested in what they want to hear rather than what God wants to hear. It all starts with pride, but then a change in perspective. Oh, well, I've got to give my kid a better life than the one that I had. Best life you can give your kid is a life that's centered in the perfect will of God. The best life you can give them is to teach them that God gave them the whole armor of God so that they'd be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that as long as they're hooked up in the right place, that's where God planted them, and as long as they grow in that place in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, then when it's time for them to go be adults, they'll be able to withstand the world. Not because of what mom and dad taught them or what mom and dad let them get involved in, or not because, I'll tell you this right now. In the grand scale of things, all the traveling that I did, all the debates that I won, all the trophies that I've got, they amount to a mountain of, you know, dirt. Now, was it fun? Yeah. Did I learn things? Yeah. Do I use them every day? Absolutely not. But I think the way that I do today, because of all the training that I had back then, but I had that critical mind, which sometimes is more of a curse than it is a blessing, but all said and done you really think that all the sports or all the extracurricular activity or you really think that all the associations or whatever it is that they want to do you really think that that's going to turn them into who they need to be now you're talking to me I played sports but I was told I had a swing that looked like Ken Griffey Jr's don't know how that happened because I'm a white dude from Kentucky and he was a black fellow from Cincinnati that actually knew how to play by baseball. Right? But you know what sports taught me? You don't get it unless you work for it. That's an important lesson to learn. And sports are a good way to teach that lesson. But when sports start pulling them out of the church pew, sports aren't teaching them anything. But Dad wasn't the only one. I played select baseball. And I didn't like it because they made us play like 100 games a summer. That's too many. Right? They wanted to, us to practice like professionals practice. I was in middle school. All I wanted to do was go home and watch a new Batman. Right? 
But I got real fed up with it real quick. But I remember there's revivals where we had a game. Guess who came in late wearing baseball clothes? Didn't have a hat on like last week. But not that I wore a hat last week, but like Dad preached on last week. What are you saying? I was there. Right? And I've heard this too. Well, the preacher's kids shouldn't mention church. The preacher's kids, I can go back if we kept count. Right? And all the stuff that we did, we missed church less in an entire year than some people do in a month. Right? It's not so good when the perspective changes, is it? But when your perspective changes, you start focusing on things that aren't all that important. Those things that you thought were going to be important end up being not so worth the effort and the time. I've never heard anybody say that they regret the amount of time that they spend at the house of God. Or regret the amount of time that they really spent in prayer with God. I find people that find that they regret the time that they did things other than what God told them to do. But if your perspective changes, all of a sudden the church isn't what the church used to be, isn't what the church is supposed to be. And God only promised that He would grow a church that was interested in what God was interested in. If you're interested in putting on a dog and pony show, there's a whole bunch of stuff people are doing nowadays, a bunch of nonsense. But when you look at them, it's easy for us to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Because we've heard truth. If you listen to preaching around here and let it impact you, you're going to have the right perspective. And when you look at it, you say, that's foolishness. But to the one doing it, they think that what they're doing has meaning, has purpose. Those people down at Asbury actually thought that what they did is going to make a difference. It'll be forgotten. In a week or two... I'll say this. In the Bible, after the disciples and the apostles had been put on trial so many times, there was a fellow that had a little bit of common sense. He said... If this be a man, it's going to fizzle out. But if God started this, there's no way that we can stop it. You know how I know what went on down there wasn't of God? Because it stopped because people in the community were complaining about public safety concerns because they was running out of parking spots. Here was my critique of the whole thing. If it was really of God, how come the kids kept going to class? Kids were only there for an hour. The rest of it was people in the community showing up doing whatever they wanted to do. If God was there and it's a so-called Christian university where they were interested in revival, if revival showed up, how come the kids weren't there? I thought it was supposed to be for them. Just saying, perspective goes a long way. I've never seen God be stopped by parking ordinances. I've never seen God's people get deterred because the gas station guy says, thanks for all the extra business, but I'm tired of having to look for a place to park when I go home. Well, how about you get in church and then that resolve itself? If it's real, if you get hooked up with it, you're going to be happy about it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Pride leads to a different perspective, and a different perspective brings about what? Punishment. Why did Israel end up where they were? Because they knew better and they did it anyway. How come in our day and age churches are closing rather than growing? Because they know better, but they're doing it different. Or somebody knew better, and because they didn't teach them right, now this generation's paying for it. What's it take? It takes a voice in the wilderness. It takes a light, a candle that's been lit and not put under a bushel takes those that will go out and salt the earth so that it can be preserved that another generation might be able to hear what thus saith the Lord it takes those that know what God said to embrace it and you know where church growth starts? personal growth because personal growth will cause you to grow and if others around you are growing that means what? you're going to grow together and a unit, a church that is growing individually and collectively 
Right? It's going to get too big for where the world wants to put them into. What does that mean? It's going to spill out of the little containment that they put them in, the little container. It says, we're okay as long as you stay over here. Well, we're not okay over here because God said to go over there. And I'm going to do what God said because I'd rather fear God, let God be true and every man a liar. And I'm sorry if it upsets you, but one of these days you'll see that what she was doing was folly. Either in this life or the next, you'll look and say, he was right. Israel couldn't even recognize it anymore once Babylon got there. They raised it to the ground. How bad did they raise it to the ground? That Nehemiah and Ezra and all those other prophets and men of God that we hear about, they had to go and take it and put it back together brick by brick because there wasn't one stone standing on top of another. You say, well, that could never happen here. Get a little pride and see what will happen. Change your perspective and see what will happen. And then you think, well, we'll just find somewhere else. Not if God doesn't want you to. You're going to have to pay the piper for letting that which God gave you and preserved for you go the way of the dodo. Because God not only stamps Ichabod on churches, God stamps Ichabod on people. And if you thought you were right in the middle of God's judgment and refuse to repent, what makes you think you're going to repent if you go to a different place? That which we have so quickly can be snuffed out, abandoned, forgotten. You say, well, I couldn't do it. Just as easily as you forget whatever it was you told yourself in the morning you needed to do before you come home. Right? And you come home and realize that you forgot. It's just that easy for your flesh if you feed it and allow it to get strong to forget the things of God get so much like the world that you don't even remember what it was like to be in the will of God that's where Israel was that's why churches are closing because there's nobody to stand up and say it's worth doing it the right way thanks to listeners like you IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel if you haven't already subscribed today and as always thanks for listening